Hey everyone, I'm Bo Ranstell. And I'm Jamie Sammons. And this is What You Watching with Jamie and Bo. Uh, let's get right to it. Jamie, what you watching? Well, okay, the first thing I have, <laughs> and you just made me think of it, uh, because you said the <laughs> word cult uh, pre-show, uh -huh. so you made me think of this. And it's not actually a movie, although I did watch a movie uh, about a cult, but this one is it's a show, on it's like a docuseries on Netflix, and it's called Wild Wild Country. And this is, uh, I, was, I don't remember if it was like six or eight episodes, but it was detailing, and I don't even, you might remember this. I don't remember this, which blows my mind. But back in 1981, there was a religious group that moved into Oregon from India, and they bought a bunch of land, and they built just all these, I mean, it was incredible. They had irrigation and farming and buildings and they had shops. They, I mean, they were a legitimate city, but they lived next to Antelope, Oregon, which was a tiny city with 40 residents, <laughs> like population 40, who hated them. And really, it's just that they thought they were, you know, they were godless because they were having free sex. And, uh, but the president of this commune, Sheila, who was actually the spokesperson for the guru that was in charge of like the whole religious aspect, she would she would go on TV and she had a huge media presence. And uh, they ended up taking over Antelope, and like they just went in and bought all this property. They just were buying property out from under the citizens, and it was this big, huge deal. And it lasted until eighty five when. They finally arrested the guru for um, he basically they busted him for violating um, uh, immigration laws. And then it just it blew up into this huge thing. And it was, there was all this media coverage practically daily. It started in Oregon and then it was nationwide. You know, Ted Koppel was involved. I don't remember this at all. Like, I have no memory of this. And I was watching the news back then. And as a family, we watched the news every day. And it's not like I was two. You know, yeah. I was old enough to pay attention to stuff like that. You'd think I would remember it, but I have zero memory. And it's nuts. I mean, like, it seriously just gets crazy. And uh, the moral of the story here, honestly, is that all of this stuff happened because these antelope people were basically just bigoted against these other people. They didn't approve of the way they lived. So they caused them a lot of problems. If they had left them alone, none of this would have happened. But all right, I agree. I've happened. seen this also. And I oh, agree. Have you? Yes, oh, I my have. God. <laughs> and I agree with you to a point. But a couple of counterpoints to your points. Okay. Uh, one point counter point count. What? Oh shit! What's the Kentucky Fried movie thing? It's I, not point counter point count pointer count. <laughs> pointer count. <laughs> Sorry, I've but. got one in the air right now. Uh, <laughs> a pointer, I mean. And I, I count for, it. So, <laughs> so first of all, I feel like I think it was like an eight episode documentary, but it ought to have been six. Okay. Like, I feel like the editing was a little loosey goosey. I'll agree times. with that. It was longer than it needed to be. Yes. Okay. So that, that is a complaint with the documentary as a whole, which I agree with you though, is really fascinating. And I don't remember it, but I was drinking a lot back then. Makes sense. Uh, you know, I was eight. What are you going to do? That, you know? that tracks. So <laughs> the other complaint I have is really with your characterization of the good people of Antelope, who I clearly identify with more than you do, because those I are, hated them. They, those are people. <laughs> I, I think one of the guys in the documentary even says it where he's like, you know, we came out here because we didn't want to be around a bunch of fucking weirdos and who moves in up the road, a bunch of fucking weirdos. No, and I get that. And it was a little retirement community. But the thing is, if they hadn't, I feel, I truly feel like if they hadn't messed with them, if they had just left them alone, then they wouldn't have started throwing their weight around. Because yeah. the only reason they started throwing their weight well, around is because these people were being dicks. Okay, and slight spoilers for this documentary, but as this situation escalates, like they're trying to get themselves put on all the, 
the uh, school boards and city councils and that kind of thing, which I understand it's good. It's good strategy, but it's not doing anything to sort of uh, warm your yourself to your neighbors. No. Well, and at that point, they were just pissed. I mean, right. Sheila. Now, she was like beyond the pale. She went out of control a little bit. Right. And they were um, carrying guns down the middle of the streets. Yeah. Which well, is... that, that started because the townspeople were driving around in trucks with guns. You know, it was. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean. I don't know. It was like the fury of the rednecks, even though there was only like right. 40 it, of them. It's just but. one of those situations. <laughs> and I, I think what, again, I think it's a good documentary. And I think what it does a good job of is kind of showing these two uh, sort of differing ideologies, completely different ideologies where one. Oh, you couldn't get more different. Right, right. It's a bunch of old white people who are like, well, you need to leave us alone. And then, you know, all the free love, new age weirdos who are more my people in my heart. But also, I can really sympathize. Like, I don't, I don't live where I live because I like being around a bunch of people, you know. And so, if a cult moved in next door, I don't care how much free sex they were having and or offering, I would still be like, man, you guys, at like 10 p.m., you got to shut this down. I love it when they're like, do you have free sex? And she's like, well, we don't charge for it if that's what you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I uh, I do get where you have a sleepy little community, you are minding your own business, and then you have thousands of people move up the road. And th the thing is, though, you don't, and, and I get where that would be, like, frustrating. But what I didn't like about it was that the, the problem with a lot of the, the locals didn't seem to be that there were a lot of people. It was that they outright thought that the, you know they didn't agree with how they were living so that automatically makes them bad and the one there was one particular local that i just couldn't stand like i hate she was a straight up cunt and it was that one with the she was sitting on the couch with her husband and she had really short cropped dark hair and she was in she talked a lot um i just couldn't stand her i don't know what er, she everything she said just made me want to punch her in the face but I do get it. Like I get where this is not the way of life that I, that I planned for. This is not what I wanted. And I can see being frustrated by that, but I think it was the way that they went about it. That really just irked me because I, they, they seem to be surprised when these other people came back at them when they like fired the first shot metaphorically yeah well there's you know, and yeah there was a lot of white entitlement happening i'm like don't kick yeah. the fucking hornet's nest because this hornet's nest has a whole lot of money i mean a lot of money like it was crazy and he had like 20 fucking rolls royces which is nuts like but and i'm not saying they i mean obviously everything that the the commune did was not right you know, they, especially the part where they ended up, they were bringing in, uh, like, the homeless people to up their numbers, and then they ended up drugging them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I you mean, could they, say that's problematic. They went, they... They cosbied an entire group of agree. homeless people. I don't agree with everything they did, but I think that when they first got there, their intentions were pure, and <laughs> I, I, I feel like if they had just left them alone, they probably wouldn't even have noticed they were there after a while. I like but, the cut of their jib, says Jamie they, Sammons. <laughs> they were peaceful people. They just wanted to farm and have sex. What's with wrong all the, with that? With all the guns and drugging the people. They, they didn't and... get until later. Like, I mean, <laughs> But if that's how all this now, ends. That's how every cult ends. Like it starts no, with all the peace and love, but eventually because people are people like politics emerges from that. Like uh, uh, Jim Jones is the the best example of this, of, you know, the people's well, temple. The, yeah, no. And I actually did. I've been gorging myself on Jim Jones stuff recently because uh, Lacey and I have talked about doing a show on Jim Jones. And this is all stuff I've watched before. I've, I've always been just, like knee deep in Jonestown. It's to me, one of the most fascinating things that has ever happened. I just, it blows my mind what the, and if you've, if you ever heard the audio um, for the, from the night that he was talking them into committing suicide. Yeah. It's terrifying. Um, it's 
heartbreaking. And it, I mean, it is, it, it just makes your skin crawl. And every time I, I listen to that or watch anything, I'm just thinking, God, how do you let something like this get so far? You know, but you're right. Like it start if, if he had died in the sixties, he would have just been known as this guy who, even though I don't really believe his intentions were ever pure, you know, completely, but back then before the people's temple or before they had moved to Guyana, he, all he did was, you know, welcome everyone of every color and every, and every, you know, from every branch of society, you know, it was a place where everyone could be. And if he had just stopped at that point, then he would probably be known as one of the, as like one of the men in the forefront of the, of the civil rights movement. Yeah, no, you know? you're, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a great book, by the way, if you haven't read it, uh, it is called the road to Jonestown came out uh, two, three years ago, something like that. And it is a phenomenal account of, of, of just what we're talking about, of the, like all the good stuff, as well as how it all went horribly wrong. And it's one of the most interesting books I've ever had the pleasure to read. That whole thing is just incredibly fascinating to me. And it's, you know, it's the cult of personality because he had that personality that uh, he when he stood in front of the pulpit and he would talk and, and you know, people could feel his passion and they believed in what he was saying. And so they followed him. And then, you know, and then he just I mean, when he died, he was just he was crazy from the syphilis. The you know, pills. I mean, he was doing the, a lot was, of pills. Oh, yeah. Just drugs and disease, and and he was just fucked beyond belief, and it just kills me to this day that people still, so many people, so many people, was it nine hundred and seventeen people or something like that? Yeah, and I'm like, God, I don't care if there were armed guards. Don't tell me that a rush of that many people. I mean, somebody's gonna die, but everyone didn't have to, you know, and it just. The whole the way that whole thing went down just oh it just kills me inside. The, but my, then my, go ahead. I'm sorry. No no no. Go ahead. I was gonna say my favorite story from that day is when they were rounding everybody up and they were starting to to hand out uh, the the flavor aid and and inject the babies and stuff. Oh yeah. And it's the one dude I can't remember his name, but walked up to one of the armed guards and was like, "Yeah, I don't want to do this." And the guard was like, "All right," and he left. That was it. It was like, you know, while other people were getting gunned down trying to leave, like this guy just got he caught the guard, the right at, guard. Right, got the right <laughs> guard at the right moment where he was like, you know what? Seems fucked up. I'm going to I'm going to hit the road. Is that cool with you? Go cool. fine by me later. Mm. I think mm. it was probably mm. less casual than that, but you get my point. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, he it just yeah. <laughs> while everybody else is just uh dropping dead and and yeah. Um, and it just it, it makes me angry and it makes me sad and it still just amazes me. And then when this particular one, the wild, wild country one had moved in, it was right after. I mean, right after, like two years after Jonestown. And it was yeah. Another like, reason ah. that people were real skittish about the, this group of weirdos moving in down the road was like, oh, right. That's true. Jonestown. That's true. I mean, I will I will concede that I get a lot of where their frustration and anger was coming from. I just feel like they they handled it poorly and then made things worse in the long run. Poor anger but, management, you know, yes. Yeah. I think I think <laughs> so many things come down to that. Um So that was one thing. We binged that in probably 2 days uh yeah. just cuz and I do th yes, there are some parts where it dragged a little and I think that was um cuz I think Pretty much every Netflix docu series is like eight episodes, so they kind of feel the need to drag it out. And some of it was padded beyond belief and did not need to be. Also, I feel like the first episode is really slow, and a lot of people probably will give. But what I've discovered about Netflix docu series is that frequently happens. You kind of have to get past the first episode, and then once you do that, then it kicks into high gear. And I've noticed that pretty much across the board with their shows 
for whatever reason they they always tend to start and then they build but what i love about it is in the is they always do this thing where they twist it and so it, like in the beginning the first several episodes i'm just like wow i love these people this is great and i turn to brian i'm like okay so when does this go horribly wrong and they start shooting everyone or something yeah, because that's just the way the netflix it they they always highlight the good in the beginning and then you're like yeah and then like halfway through it'll just be like but then it took a dark turn yeah <laughs> You know, those are produced, or a couple of those documentary series are produced by the Duplass brothers. You know what? That that's right. I did know that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, so I I do recommend it though. I think it's a fascinating watch, especially since for whatever reason I've never heard of it. I didn't remember it, and even beyond remembering it, I haven't even heard of it since then. Like this is something that completely flew under my radar, and it's kind of a big deal. So. <laughs> I'm shocked, but um, it's definitely, uh, I think it's a fascinating watch just for historical purposes. Awesome. All right. Uh, my turn. I saw a movie called Censor. Okay. Uh, I wanted to see that. I have not. Okay. So let me tell you everything that happens in it. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Save me the trouble. Right. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a vivid storyteller, Jamie. It'll be just like you saw it. Uh, but it'll only take like seven minutes. Uh, no, here. So I really like Sensor. I, I don't love Sensor, but also I think I need to watch it again. But all right. So the, the premise of it is there is a woman who is working um, on the Sensor board in England during the whole video nasties era. Yes. And she's one of the people who is sort of uh, recommending making notes on movies to cut it down so that it can be released or in some cases say like, Oh, this movie is beyond uh, repair. Uh, we're just going to have to censor the entire film. And there is also in her background, a situation where she and her younger sister were probably in the woods and maybe she killed her younger sister or maybe her younger sister was abducted. It's really unclear, but <laughs> it, but either, regardless, her sister went missing that day in the woods. And then years later, as she's working as, as a censor on this, uh, this movie board, um, she sees a movie that features an actress that she becomes convinced is her younger sister. And oh. so, and, right. And so the movie is sort of her pursuit of that, but it's not a real like procedural kind of, of movie. It's much more surreal than that. And, as with a lot of these movies, the question becomes, is any of this actually happening? Is this only happening in the mind of the protagonist? Um, or is it some combination of the two or something else entirely? And uh, it's it, in that regard, it's really interesting. The best thing about the movie is sort of the back end of it as it gets more and more into the surreal territory. And there's a lot of great creepy moments where just you as an audience member are conflicted about how to interpret a scene, you know, where you're like, wait a second, is she, is she actually crazy or is this weird behavior actually some conspiracy? And it's on that level, really, really interesting, really entertaining. It's, gorgeous especially towards the uh the end of the film when it really embraces that kind of 80s uh 35 millimeter print aesthetic and it looks great it has a a, a lot in common i think with uh, a movie like saint maud oh okay and and in fact that the those movies remind me of one another quite a bit I probably prefer St. Maud, but I think Censor is also very good. Would I like it? I know Duncan would. I haven't listened to his recent episode where he's seen it, but I'm willing to bet money that he really, really liked it. Would you like it? Mm, I think you would find it a little slow. I don't have a problem with slow. Yeah. I mean, I love you. Um, I get that. <laughs> And I, I think it's rude. <laughs> and that totally expected. Yeah. And and yet, 
Uh, and yet the, the fact that the knives are out just means that the show's really going now. Um, but, uh, I, I think, I think you and I would probably come down around the same place of like, I'm glad I saw that, but it's, it's probably like, would it end up on a top 10 list potentially just because there, there's a lot to it. There's some, there's some meat on the bone. Um, but there, there is also room in my heart for a, a, you know, a schlocky fun movie to come along that I would like more because I'm a little bit of a shithead. Okay. Now I assume that these are all fictional characters. Yeah. 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 There it's not okay. like, you know, Hey, here's a Joe D'Amato movie or something. Although they do, uh, include some of the movie driller killer. Oh, in in the uh in in the film sensor so just a couple of clips here and there but there's also like a uh, the director that is sort of this weird recluse you know director of of uh controversial horror films um when they kind of go in search of him like that's a totally fictional character and they and that's what's kind of fun about the movie is there are moments that recreates this sense of like you know 80s grindhouse kind of movies uh, where you're like, I, again, I don't know if this is really happening or if this is just a grindhouse movie and that, that part of it's really fun, but there were also moments. And I think maybe because I'd seen St. Maud, you know, not, not all that long ago that I'm like, eh, okay. Like, I feel like this is treading some of that same territory. Okay. Interesting. Well, I will definitely check it out then if, uh, nothing if out of nothing more than curiosity yeah for for sure and like i feel like i'm damning it with faint praise and i don't mean to uh because i enjoyed the movie a lot when i saw it but um it's also one of those that's like eh, this isn't for everybody you know i could also see somebody coming away from this movie and being like that was just obtuse bullshit and i'm like yeah well kind of it's certainly not spoon feeding anything to anybody cool okay all right what, what you got after my artsy okay. fartsy movie, which is well, uh, I'm not too far off that territory with this one in certain respects, I guess. Uh, I just recently watched Promising Young Woman. Ooh, that's good. That is good shit. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is so good. And I was not expecting uh, pretty much any of it. Like I didn't really know anything about the film going in, and I, I wasn't expecting the tone. But I really loved it because like in the middle of the film, you get this like practically romantic comedy montage. And uh, when, you know, she's found the one and, you know, she's going to be happy before shit gets real. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but I, I really I really enjoy that. And I did see on the Shutter group. Someone had mentioned they were watching it and they were excited. They're like, I'm finally watching this. Yay. And then somebody was like, oh, fuck that movie. I hate that movie. You know, it's all it's all about how evil men are. And this is a, a woman saying this. She's like, and men are not all men are not evil. And I'm like, that is completely not what it was saying. But OK, uh, <laughs> like weird flex, but OK. Um, the I mean, like to me, the whole point is that there are a lot of people that are culpable when things go on. And a, a lot of pieces have to fall in place for things to happen the way they do. And the fact that the title of the whole fucking film is a nod to the Brock Turner case, I think should kind of clue you in on what they're trying to say. But I didn't find it offensive in that respect at all. I mean, I obviously don't believe that all men are evil. And I also don't think that's what the movie is saying. You know, I and then I saw some people complaining about the fact that they were using People that you recognize, like Bo Burnham and stuff like that, uh, that uh, and, uh, that they their personalities didn't really fit the personalities that they had them in the film. To which I responded, I liked that about it because when you have when you're confronted, and he wasn't the only one. There was like McLovin was in it. You know, there was a, a lot of people that you recognize. Adam Brody um, were in this film, and when they present you with these characters played by people who are disarming and familiar but they put them in a completely different setting than what you're used to seeing them in i think it works really well and i just adored it and the and then everybody's like oh it's such a downer are you kidding me i didn't think it was a downer at all as a matter of fact i 
when when the end end came, and I'm not going to spoil it, but when the end end came, I was laughing hysterically because it's just the way everything unfolded. Um, I was just pumped. Like I was just like, yes, you know, and then, uh, you know, like yeah, the one guy who just starts, who just takes off, like he just starts running. <laughs> at the yeah, yeah. And I'm just, I was laughing because it's not, it's not that the situation is funny. It's just that the way that everything unfolded to me, it was just perfection. Like I, 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 I couldn't have asked for anything more from that film. There was nothing I didn't love about it. I that is just really good shit. Yeah, it's definitely a dark, dark comedy for sure. But I, yeah, I agree with you that I think if you're just coming away from that movie thinking it is somehow just an anti male screed, then you're kind of missing most of that movie because it's like you said, because of the title and, and what that suggests, it's so much more about the the ripple effects of something like that of, yes. of a sexual assault and the way it affects everyone around like it poisons everyone around it uh male and female alike you know and yeah it, like it's a really it's very funny it's uh carrie mulligan's performance in it is so goddamn good um I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that like, like I, I was very much the same that when I went into it, I didn't know all the beats of it or anything. And I didn't know, like I didn't knew nothing about the ending and all that stuff. So when I watched it, um, there is that moment in the film where you're like, Oh my God, if this is how it ends, I'm not sure that I'm down with this. Right. Because it just makes me feel terrible. Yeah. And, and it is really dark at that, at that yeah. point. And it is depressing at that point. But, <laughs> but, but when you, yes, when you get to the very end of the movie, there is that moment of catharsis that you really need in that film. Um, but it also doesn't let you off the hook. Like it still leaves you with a, a lot to think about in terms of, um, you know, sort of the wages of vengeance. Cause it's about that too. It's about like, you know, like Carrie Mulligan is not just a hero in that movie. She is also someone who has very clear mental health issues but as a result of this right like she is completely shut down she she stops her life um because of this thing that happened to her friend and um yeah it's great though it's a great movie I, i'm glad it was nominated for best picture you know it was one of those that was like oh yeah for sure that totally deserves i mean nomadland is also nominated and that's just not fair because Nomadland is one of the best movies of the you know past decade, but but Promising Young Woman, a uh, fantastic movie. I think it got. Did it get a uh, best original screenplay? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I will fact check that. I know Carrie Mulligan was nominated for it. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. uh all right. Uh, Promising Young Woman was nominated, yes, Best Original Screenplay, Best Picture, Best Actress, Best Director, and Best Editing. So uh, those were all the films it was nominated for. Deserving of every one of those nominations, I must say. Oh, for sure. Uh, it won Best Original Screenplay. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought that was it, that it at least took that away. Yeah. Which I think is definitely deserved but, absolutely yeah. it's a fantastic script um yeah and very funny bo burnham's really funny in it um much much funnier than that fucking inside special you know what i'm saying jamie yeah you know what i'm saying <laughs> don't make me joke i mean i, I get it you know <laughs> you're very a very thoughtful young man um <laughs> Uh, okay, let me let me give you another one. Um, not quite in this vein, but sort of in that vein. Um, and that is a movie that I watched for the first time called A Monster Calls. I have not seen it. Okay, so it's it's a little older. Um, although we've been talking about relatively modern films which uh, is interesting this one this one's about five years old comes from 2016 and so here's the premise you've got um the the girl from rogue one 
whose name I can't remember right now. The oh no, that's fuck, I don't fucking. Uh, uh, Felicity the only one Jones. I know is the, Felicity okay, Jones okay. is her name. Okay, I'm looking at it now. So Felicity Jones um, is a, a young mother who uh, is sing- a single mom. Her husband has has fled to America, where he's from, with a younger woman. And uh, she has a, a son played by a kid named Lewis McDougal, and uh, and and Felicity Jones is clearly sick and clearly dying. And uh, Sigourney Weaver plays her mother, uh, and Sigourney Weaver is fantastic in it. But uh, her uh, Sigourney Weaver is this very like strict, prim, very aristocratic feeling English woman, and the at <laughs> one night a giant tree monster comes to this boy's window and says, I'm going to tell you three stories. And at the end of that, you're going to tell me one. That kind of sounds like a del Toro setup. It's you know? yeah. It, it, it's not as visually striking as a del Toro movie, although it, it has its moments. Uh, but yes, it is very much a, let's use this kind of dark fantasy concept and tell a very a very human story about this kid trying to come to terms with the ensuing death of his mother uh who it, like they never put a name to it but she's like clearly dying of like cancer or something because she's having all these treatments and and so forth and Sigourney Weaver is sort of left to uh to to try to keep this kid from losing his mind and um it's it, the the thing about it i don't want to spoil any of it cuz it's it's kind of a wonderful movie it's very sad but in one of the again a very cathartic kind of way like it's a good like if you want a one of those uh from the gut kind of cries in a movie this is your film um and uh liam neeson is the voice of the tree monster what comes Ooh. to tell stories yeah. And so, you know, he's, I've got a very specific set of skills. I'm going to tell you some <laughs> stories. First of all, get under the bed. Um, yeah, it's, but it's really good. And, uh, and when it kind of, I, I think it hit me for a couple of reasons. One, you know, not so many years ago, my stepmother died of cancer. And so seeing someone go through this to up to and including, sort of the the conflicting emotions that you have in the midst of that and and you know that's a universal experience anyone who's been through uh that with a family member um it you know it's just one of those things that you'll never forget it it really kind of tattoos your soul to some degree um so i on that level i really related to it also jamie and this is where it gets dicier <laughs> Well, I was on board so far. Okay. <laughs> also, this happened to be the first the first movie that uh the the lady I've been seeing recommended we watch. And so uh, it was the first movie I watched with her and it fucking ruined me. Like I was just weeping. And I was like, well, this is easily the most emasculating movie I've ever seen. <laughs> As I'm just bawling as this poor kid is, you know, telling his story to the tree monster. And it's just the most heartbreaking thing in the world. And uh, and I, I, I think it was a test. And I either, I either passed spectacularly or failed miserably. And I can't tell. I was going to say, it sounds like it was a test <laughs> right. to see what your reaction would be. R- I right. can't imagine that it would be a negative thing. I mean, you're still seeing her, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, so I, there you go. Yeah, I, I think it all worked out. And and as it happened, she was, like later she was like, "Yeah, I just love movies that made me cry." And I was like, "Well, that does. That is that is a very sad movie." <laughs> After that, we'll watch My Life, and uh, I think there's some Holocaust videos I've got laying around here. That'll that'll make you weep. Um, but yeah, but it was a really good movie, and like and like I said, I think it, it, for those people um, who have been through that, you know, r- just dreadful experience of uh, 
uh, of of like dealing with a being close with a family member dying of cancer and dealing with the hospital and the treatments and the sickness and all that stuff. Um, it's very poignant uh, because it gets to some kind of difficult truths about you know how a human being feels about that. You know, not necessarily the person suffering, although it does some of that too, but sort of the person that has to to, to observe it. And right. and the the fact that, you know, sometimes people are kind of shitty and they think shitty things and they feel shitty things. Uh, but it's all part of that experience. And it, it that was a thing like it gets to sort of a, a, a human truth. And there are so few movies that you see that are like, oh, that movie actually explores a very complicated emotion in a really deft way, you know, so that if if you if you're again, have been through something like this, you're like, oh, I totally know exactly what that feels like. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons that art is so great, right? Is that it, it, it lets us know that we are not alone, that, that a lot of these experiences are in fact, um, universal to the condition and, uh, especially something that can be so like isolating as grief is. Uh, I think that's super important, you know, that, you you do get constant reminders that like oh in all of this sadness you are not alone in it um not to quote ted lasso but you know to quote ted lasso uh you know he uh have you watched that have you watched ted lasso no oh my god you gotta watch it anyway so there's a great moment uh where after a game is lost ted lasso says i know right now you're all feeling sad but let me tell you there's something worse than that and that's being sad and alone. And right now, all of you look at the other people in this locker room and understand that you may be sad, but you will never be alone in this room. Aww. Right? Ted Lasso is a perfect good, Jamie. It's that's going to make me cry. It's, oh my God, that show. It's so good. Uh, second season starting pretty soon. You ought to, you ought to. Oh, well, I will get on board then. You, you absolutely should. And you ought to uh, text me. Um, as the emotions hit you from that show, because there are characters that you will hate and then grow to love, and there are characters that you will love and grow to hate. It is, it's amazing. It's a wonderful show. Anyway, cool. that's my a monster calls. Uh, well, that sounds really honestly. That sounds really good, and I'm kind of surprised I haven't heard anyone mention it. Well, you know, it, it's not a horror film by any stretch, or in, no more so. I mean, like, Pan's Labyrinth is more of a horror film than this is. Um, but, yeah, you know, but it's a very quiet movie. It's it's sort of an under-the-radar kind of film, but, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely has some emotional punch to it. Um, anyway. What an, uh, feel free to take us out of maudlin territory here, Jamie. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you been watching the Fear Street films on Netflix? I watched about four and a half minutes of the first one. Why? Uh, because that was the point where I was like, I don't think I'm in the mood for this. Oh, my God. They're so fun. And now I... <laughs> I, I <laughs> I don't know what that noise was, but I love it. Um, <laughs> they, they really are very fun. And I particularly enjoyed 1978. I, I had a, I had more fun with that one. But I, I do think that they are just really fun. And it, I thought it was going to be like while I was watching the first one, I was just like, oh, is this going to be like one of those? scream tv show things where none of the main characters are ever gonna die like you everyone's gonna get to the end and they're gonna be safe and that's kind of like how i felt it was going to be and then that is not how it is and i i was genuinely surprised by that and and in a very good way they're kind of brutal and the uh, the second one is uh, really just very visceral and fun. You know, they're the first one's very nineties. So there's a lot of nineties music going on. Like the, the one thing I had said about it from the beginning, and it, it's true for both of them so far is that they really lean on the soundtrack almost to a suicide squad degree. 
you know, where it's like we're 10 minutes into the movie and I've heard four songs already. Yeah, you know? that's so not I, selling me on anything. I get what you're doing, movie, but, you know, but then after a while, then you're just you're just so into it that, you know, you're like, OK. And there was they didn't use any Nirvana in the in the first one anyway. Um, they actually did this kind of like Nirvana Bowie thing in the second one, which was cool. But. Uh, once I, once I just like got in, well, I had fun from the beginning. I didn't ever want to check out of it, but I, um, once I got into it, I really enjoyed it. And I was really excited when, and when we got to the end of the first one and then we watched the second one and I was excited for it because, and I, I had an idea of what was going to happen and I was looking forward to that. And I really enjoyed it and then the third one takes place in 1666 which i'm super excited about because it's all about witchcraft and part of me is like where where what kind of top 40 hits are they going to use from the puritan era <laughs> because like yeah you've, you've got your uh <laughs> your hymns you know, that were popular in the day. Right. I think there's some Gregorian chants that were real bangers back then. <laughs> now, I will say when, because at the end of the, yeah, I think that's legit. And when you get to the end of them, they kind of <laughs> get you just catch up to that one? the next one. <laughs> I was I was in the middle of a thought. Um, <laughs> they um, First time's the hardest. They, uh. They give you teases as to the next one. The third one honestly feels, and just from the, 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 just from the few little snippets that we get, the immediate thing that popped into my head is the witch. And uh, part of that was the score. And I'm just like, oh God, please, 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 please. Like, I'm really looking forward to it. It's coming out on Friday. And I really want them to kind of lean into the witch part of it. Because the first one was very screamish. Because it was in the 90s. The second one was very Friday the 13th-ish. Because, well, it took place in 78. But they were going hardcore for like 80 slashers. And, of course, this one's in the 1600s. So I'm really hoping that they will kind of give us a little bit of Eggers in there. And we'll see, you know. But so far, I'm having a lot of fun with the series. So. Yeah, I need to go back to it. Like, I, I just, it was one of those things where I was just not in the mood for it. You know, as as soon as I saw the girl kind of stalking around the store as somebody was hiding amongst the shelves, uh, that was the point where I was like, eh, I just, I'm not feeling a slasher movie right now. And that's where this feels like it's headed. Yeah. And you're and you're not wrong. Uh, I do. I do think, though, that it had, it, you know, it has some surprises and it has some good characters. They The characters didn't annoy me uh, like often happens. It. I really enjoyed the character work and and I enjoyed what they did with it. I enjoyed the places they were willing to go, particularly in the second one. So, um, yeah, I would say, you know, when you're feeling when you're feeling froggy, give it another shot. Yeah, I definitely will, especially when uh, if and when if not an if when all three are out, if they're not already out. That's what I was getting at. Uh, Yeah, there's some Sunday that I'll just truck through all of them and and get those under the belt. Hey, I've got a I've got one that you ought to see if you haven't yet. Okay. Um Werewolves Within. Oh my god, is that available yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh go, I have been waiting for that movie. I want to see it so bad and I think yeah, I think it came out early July, right? So it kind of I've been waiting for it for so long it slipped past me, but Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to get it uh at one of the theaters around here and or go see it at one of the theaters around here and and nobody was playing it which was a bummer um and then yeah like a week after it's you know somewhat limited release uh it hit all the streaming services and so yeah i watched it uh on amazon and i think it was only like six bucks it wasn't one of those 20 dollar premieres or nothing um but yeah it's it's really solid that's a occasionally very very funny movie um, what I would say about it is without giving anything away, cause it's kind of a whodunit, right? Is the idea of both the game and the movie is someone is a werewolf in our midst. We don't know who it is. Mm-hmm. And so that's where a lot of the 
tension and the comedy comes from as this group of weirdos and knuckleheads assemble at this end to try to determine who the werewolf is and then later kind of go off on their own to get picked off and or eat people as it happens. Um, and it's really funny most of the time. Uh, the I'm going to have to look up the, the actor's name because he showed up in uh, The Tomorrow War as well. Um, which I, oh, I saw that too. Uh, I didn't make it to the end of that one. Um, there, there was a a certain point where it was like, I don't care about anything that's happening in this movie (laughs) and I'm tired. (laughs) Um, but the, so the guy that is sort of the, uh, somewhat funny sidekick in that Sam Richardson is the actor's name. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think I saw him in the trailer. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's um he is the main character. He plays a a ranger who has come to this sleepy town. Um and he's going to be the new uh ranger for the season there in this little snowy hideaway. Uh there is a postwoman that he very quickly befriends. There's a oil tycoon who is trying to convince everybody, not oil, it's natural gas. That's what he's trying to get. He's trying to get everybody to like sell their land so that they can build uh, or do some fracking or something in the area. And so there are people in the town that are kind of the right wing uh, characters who are totally for this. And then you have kind of the hippie left wing characters in the movie that are trying to save the town and that's not a giant deal within the film but it comes up a bunch and you know there there's definitely some comedy mind from that as well uh there is the reclusive scientist who is there who uh discovers that what they're they might be after is a werewolf after all and uh she's a pretty funny character but it's really um uh let me let me find the the, melina vaintrub who plays the the post woman and uh, apparently is in AT and T commercials? Although uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I was told that. Um, anyway, she is just a delight in this movie. Like she's really the glue that kind of holds it all together. Because Sam Richardson's character is very neurotic and and um, occasionally like off puttingly uh like nervous and and weak uh you know but that's his arc you know he gets a backbone as the movie goes on but um it's very funny there's some really funny shit in it uh it's a werewolf movie so i know you would like it on that level yeah um you know that my biggest problem with it is i felt like it was real predictable so that the whodunit part of it didn't actually feel like that that much of a mystery uh, where by the end when it, you know, they kind of reveal the werewolf within, it was like, well, yeah, of course. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of a bummer that, and, and so I don't know that it's totally successful, but that said the ride of getting to that point is totally fun. Um, one of the characters is this lady who's got a, uh, I'm trying to find the actress's name. Michaela Watkins is her name, um, who is incredibly funny in it. And I'm not sure where I've seen her before, but I know I have. And she plays this, like, the right wing uh, kind of crazy lady that is pissed off that the rest of the town won't just give in so she can sell her house uh, for an obscene amount of money. And, uh, and she's very, very funny in it. And I, like I said, I don't know where I've seen her before, but I know I have, and she's great. Um, and that's really the best part of all of this is that, uh, the cast is really good and really funny. And you can tell that like a lot of them are come from comedy backgrounds and that kind of thing. Um, so it's not, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly scary about werewolves within, but there's plenty of horror trappings and all that. Uh, but it's, it's primarily a comedy and a pretty good one. 
Awesome. That is good to know because I really have been very excited about it and I've been wanting to see it. So that did, makes me happy. Did you see Scare Me on yes. Shutter? Okay, yes. so the guy who did that, this is his next movie. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. So, right. So I enjoyed Scare Me quite a bit. I didn't yeah. think it was perfect, but I thought it was really good. And no, so, but it was fun, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so this feels like the evolution of that guy doing a bigger movie. And it's again, not totally perfect, but it has that spirit of being very silly and willing to kind of go out there and stuff. Uh, but he also clearly knows horror tropes. So as the movie's going on, you're going to be like, Oh, okay. This, of course, this all feels like it all has all the beats of a horror movie, but it's just way too silly to be one, you know? Okay. Cool. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot of fun. So uh, we got 10 minutes left. How about you bring us home with one? <clears throat> okay. Did you, and man, I have not one dead puppy on a porch story, but. You know. I, yeah, I know. That's, uh, <laughs> we, we, I, but we front loaded this with all our cult talk. That, that's oh, the that's problem. Oh, that's true, yeah. Um, cults are always a problem. Did you see America the Motion Picture? No. Oh, okay. It's on Netflix. Oh. And uh, it came out, uh, I think, like July 2nd or something. For <laughs> And it is the most, it's an animated film, but it's the most ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, like straight up werewolves. Um, it, basically, it completely, it tells the complete wrong story about... <laughs> Uh, about how the Revolutionary War, how America got started, like where Abraham Lincoln and George Washington are best friends, and <laughs> they, and then uh, like George Washington dies, and and oh no, I'm sorry, wait, Abraham Lincoln dies, and George Washington is trying to um, fulfill his his dream, and so then he teams up with um, oh shit, redcoats are coming, Paul Revere. Paul Revere. And, uh, <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's ridiculous and it is not at all historically accurate. Like I was like, I really hope nobody is watching this as like a cliff notes for <laughs> their U S history class, but it's really funny. It's just, it's irreverent. It's, it's hilarious. And, uh, it was a really good time. Like I, I just, I, I had a really, really fun, it was, I forget who made it, but it, would it kind of feels like something that Trey Parker and Matt Stone would do, uh -huh. but it's not them. But um, I can I just... can give you the stats on this. Oh, okay. uh, the director is a guy named Matt Thompson, and this has me excited to see this now. Not not just because you were recommending it, but his credits are um, Archer. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, Frisky Dingo and C Lab Twenty Twenty One. Yeah, if you, I think, especially if you are an Archer fan, then you probably get a kick out of it just because then you're already in line with the kind of humor that he has. And it is so over the top. Just so, I mean, there are, there are war elephants during the Revolutionary War. I mean, it just goes places that you're just like, what the fuck are you doing? Wow. Oh, there's a, there are like basically what is like a revolutionary war version of an at at. Um, and <laughs> like that's very funny. You yeah, can't, it's... I cannot overstate how ridiculous it is, but it's so enjoyable and so much fun. It's got that... a stack cast too: Channing Tatum, Jason Manzucas, yes, Olivia yeah. Munn, Bobby Moynihan, Judy Greer, who is my secret crush. Uh, Will Forte, Killer Mike, Andy Samberg, Simon Pegg. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's totally worth your time. I like if you take anything away from this, take that away. And I would love to hear what you think, because I really think that you get a kick out of it. Uh, what is the dun, dun, dun. is it available on uh, streaming? Where did you say I think it? it's on Netflix? I want to say it was a Netflix or was it Netflix? It was either Netflix or Prime. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix. Um, you know, I, I saw this actually, I, yeah, it is Netflix. I saw this, uh, pop up and I, I didn't watch it, uh, at the time because the description of it too closely matched the idea I had for a script 
I, uh, oh. from years ago, and I got kind of mad about it. <laughs> Where I was like, how dare somebody make a movie that is similar to a thing I thought one time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get that though. No, no, no. I get that. And then you don't want to see it because it'll just piss you off even more. Right. You know? Especially if it's yeah. good. Like if it's shit, then I'll feel good about it. But if, uh, cause they'll be like, ha, ah, they fucked it up. Only I, I'm the only one who could have written this properly. Uh, but if it's actually good, then I got to like face my demons and realize that, you know, I've probably peaked that the, the best years are behind me. <laughs> I seriously doubt the description <laughs> even comes close to how just ridiculous it is. Oh, Sam Adams is in it too. And um maybe maybe it's not Paul. Maybe Paul Revere isn't. No, because no, it is Paul Revere because he has his, his steed. But uh you know, Sam Adams is in it and he and he's just drinking all the time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh drinking beer specifically all the time. And I don't know, it's just <laughs> I was I was just dying like it, it's fucking fun it's just so fun uh, I it, it's a high recommend all right well uh I'll tell you what we should probably bring this in for a landing uh well with only four minutes left if, if, if we didn't mention it up front and I know we didn't the this show is guaranteed guaranteed to be no more than an hour long that's right yeah that is our promise to you the listener um and you'll likely thank us for it. <laughs> Probably. I mean, or not. If, if like, here's the thing. If you really wanted a bunch more, then just wait for like three weeks and then it'll be like one three hour show. Ah, there you or go. three months. Yeah. Stack them up. Right. Sandbag them. <laughs> You'd be a pleasure delayer. Uh, as Penelope Cruz said in Vanilla Sky. I think they sell that pleasure delayers yeah at like at adam and eve yeah i think that's just called a cock ring <laughs> <laughs> or a rubber band hey whatever's handy yeah yeah bread, bread tie hair scrunchie yeah. <laughs> Bre bread tie is pretty good twist tie it on there that's you know but here's my problem sometimes that like when you're trying to uh untwist the tie on bread like you, you you go the wrong way and it just ends up tying it tighter oh i did that the other day yeah with, that's with a, bread with bread yeah well <laughs> i mean now that we've talked about it it's just gonna be a thing I know, and then before you know it it's like falling off you know like like with bulls yeah yeah you know <laughs> No, yeah, no, I'm with you. I was just okay, thinking, okay. how how can we get this on Urban Dictionary? <laughs> and what do you call it? <laughs> Listeners, get this on Urban Dictionary and call it something funny. <laughs> All right, though, we've that only is got our task. <laughs> yeah, you've got homework. Don't you know? Look, you knew the deal when you'd listen to this. You were coming out of this with work to do. Um, <laughs> hey, we're we're running out of time. Tell tell people where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on this show and you can also <laughs> find me if you're on... here, you can listen to this. <laughs> you can also find me on horror in the house of salmons. And that is available on anchor, which means it's available everywhere. Oh, and new show dropping midnight tonight on the 15th. Oh, fancy pants. Yeah. What's, what's the new show about? Uh, the new show how we talk about the dead and we talk about Devil's Pass. Those are the mm -hmm. alphabet movies. And then we do a rant about things that piss us off <laughs> in in movies uh, that where people get shit wrong. Like, you know, nobody burned witches in Salem, for instance. Um, and then uh, then it's the last of our A movies for if we're closing out the A's for the Colossal Collection. Oh, wow. What's, what's the last A? Can you say? Avengers. The Marvel movie? Oh, all right. Yeah, that's the very last A in our collection. Now we are because we go through everything genre, genre notwithstanding. So any movie we own is uh, we talk about in that. And the very last A movie on our shelf is The Avengers. Oh, uh, yeah, I watched that over uh, quarantine. Um, yeah, it's a bummer about uh, Joss Whedon, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you I <know>. mean, <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> I mean, it is. It, it is. But, I mean, are you really surprised? 
surprised. No, I'm not surprised, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that I'm not hurt by it. No, I get it. I get it. I love Firefly. <laughs> And that oh, stings. Oh fuck yeah! We just watched that. We just watched that again. I love that show. I'm yeah. still gonna love that show. I don't care who he, what he, I, I, kind of a jerk he is. Yeah, yeah. What, what kind of misogynist asshole he is? I'll watch all his feminist programs. That's the funniest part about it. Well, that's how you know it's like a Republican getting caught with their you know hand on a guy's cock. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. Or tell evangelist getting caught with a hooker. Yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, clap when they go to the bathroom. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> Make sure they don't steal from you, Jamie. <laughs> I don't hear any clapping in there. <laughs>